Turn to Romans chapter 9, verse 1, Romans chapter 9. We're now more than halfway through the letter to the Romans. 16 chapters, we've covered 8. Now we're over the top and going downhill towards the end. Romans chapter 9. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen by race. They are Israelites, and to them belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and of their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ. God, who is over all, be blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his descendants. But through Isaac shall your descendants be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned as descendants. For this is what the promise said. About this time I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told, the elder will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not upon man's will or exertion, but upon God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I have raised you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy upon whomever he wills, and he hardens the heart of whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault, for who can resist his will? But who are you, a man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me thus? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for beauty? and another for menial use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience the vessels of wrath made for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory to the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, Those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call my beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will execute his sentence upon the earth with rigor and dispatch. And as Isaiah predicted, If the Lord of hosts had not left us children, 
we would have fared like Sodom and been made like Gomorrah. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we are all conscious as we read this passage of the limitations of our mind and reason. Thy thoughts are not our thoughts. We pray, therefore, that thy Holy Spirit may remove from our minds any prejudice or barrier or preconceived notion that would prevent us from accepting thy word this morning. Lord, if anything is difficult to us or even offensive to us, we pray that thou wilt show us that the fault lies in us and not in thee. And we ask that this passage and its study this morning may lead to comfort and not to controversy, that it may give us a wider view of thyself, a bigger view of thy majesty and of thy power. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In reading Paul's letter to the Romans, some people stop at the end of chapter 8 and they don't read any further. And in fact, they will know chapters 1 to 8 quite well and chapters 9 to 11 rather badly. Some people reading the letter to the Romans, when they get to the end of chapter 8, jump over to the beginning of chapter 12. And chapter 12 is a favorite chapter. Other people read through chapters 9 to 11 but can't make anything of them and treat them as a kind of parenthesis in the middle. Now let me say straight away they are very difficult chapters. Chapters 9 to 11, you're really going to have to work. Put your thinking cap on. They're very deep and very difficult. Furthermore, when you do understand them, they are profoundly disturbing. They upset a number of our ideas. In particular, because they are based upon this idea of divine predestination. And if there's one thing causes discussion and questions and controversy, it's that little word predestination. Our human reason hates this idea. It is offensive to us that God should manage my life. And we want to manage our own. There is a profound difference between those who see things from man's point of view and those who see things from God's point of view. I think most people that I have spoken to would sum up their ideas like this. God votes for me, Satan votes against me, but I cast the deciding vote. I think most people seem to think like that. That in the last analysis, their future, their destiny, depends upon their vote and not on anyone else's. But to think like that is to make God and Satan and myself equals, with each of us having an equal vote in the situation so that it was my vote that settled which side I would be on, whether I'd be on Satan's side or God's. I voted it, I elected it, I chose it, I willed it. But that is not the truth, and that is not the situation. It was God who voted me into his kingdom. It was God who elected me. I didn't elect him. I didn't put God on the throne. He was on the throne before he began and he gave me a place by his side. It was his will, his vote, his choice, his election, his predestination. Well, now let's remember then that Paul put chapters 9 to 11 into his letter, and God allowed him to, and therefore they are a vital part of the argument. Now, you won't find this Sunday morning nearly as comforting or as nice as last Sunday morning, the tragedy is there are far too many people in the world and inside the church who just like the nice bits that they agree with in the Bible. Love to read Romans 8 and rarely read Romans 9. Now this is a wrong way to deal with God's word. Either you take it all or you don't take any. Either we say, God, I'll accept all you say, or you must throw the whole thing out because it all hangs together. Let me try and show you how essential Romans 9 to 11 are to the whole epistle. 
The basic problem dealt with in chapters 9, 10 and 11 is the problem of the Jews. How do they fit in now? They seem to be in a rather queer position. They're God's chosen people and yet they're not enjoying God's blessings. They are the very ones he chose from the very beginning and yet look at them now. They are suffering, they are scattered, they seem to be right out of his will. It almost seems as if God has forgotten about them and let them go and gone back on all his promises. He said he would do so much for them and look at their history for the last 2,000 years. Where do they all fit in now? Is it that God has washed his hands of the Jews as they tried to wash their hands of him? Has God finished with them? Have they no future in his plan? Is it all the Christian church now? That's the problem. And it grows out of chapter 8. In chapter 8, Paul said, when God chooses you, he keeps you. But what about the Jews? He chose them. Has he kept them? Paul said, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And yet the Jews seem to have got separated from it. And they certainly knew it once upon a time. You see how the problem comes out of chapter 8 and chapter 9 begins to tackle this problem. Where do they fit in? Now you will realize, of course, that for Paul this was a very personal problem. He was a Jew and he didn't cease to be a Jew. He didn't say after he became a Christian, I am no longer a Jew, now I'm a Christian. He said, I am still a Jew, but I'm a Christian Jew now. And for him it was a, an acute problem when he saw his own relatives out of God's blessing. Now that's a problem to anyone. When you become a Christian and you've got close relatives and friends who don't know Christ, it becomes a sheer agony to you. How much greater an agony that would be if those relatives and friends had had unique opportunities and unique privileges and unique blessings from God and had turned them down and were just right out of them. And if you felt they were the very, very people whom God wanted to be his people, what an agony of mind and heart this would bring. And this is where we are in chapter 9. It was a personal problem. I'll just link it up one other way. Paul is dealing in Romans with the problem of sin and the cure of salvation. And when he dealt with sin, he dealt with sin in the Gentile first and then sin in the Jew. And it's a different kind of problem. Having dealt now with salvation for the Gentile, he's got to go on to talk of salvation for the Jew. And so chapters 9 to 11 just had to come in at this point. He said in chapter 1, this is sin in the Gentile. In chapter 2 and 3, he said, this is sin in the Jew. In chapters 4 to 8, he said, this is salvation for the Gentile. And now in chapters 9 to 11, he's got to go on to talk of salvation for the Jew. Will the Jews ever get saved? Will the Jews ever get to heaven? Will they get back into God's blessing? Have they any future? Or are they just finished with, to be pushed around the earth? Well, that's the problem. We begin to deal with it this morning by looking simply first at Paul's deep personal sorrow about this. And then we go on to look at something that you've got to understand if you're going to understand Jewish history. God's sovereignty and power over it all. His control of every part. Paul's sorrow. Do you know, it's extraordinary to go on from chapter 8 to chapter 9. Chapter 8, you have a man who's happy, a man who's rejoicing, a man who's on top of the world. I know that all things work together for good. I know that nothing can separate me from the love of God. I can call God Abba Father. It's wonderful. And a man on top of the world. And suddenly in chapter 9, he's a man in the depths of despair and sorrow. Now, some people think that when you're living in the Spirit, you're finished with all your burdens, all your sorrow, all your tension, all your strain and frustration. Not a word of it. At the same time as Paul rejoiced in his own calling, in God's power over his life, 
He said, I'm telling you the truth. You may not believe it, but I, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. In my heart, there's a sorrow that goes on all the time. Now, I think some of you will understand this. You are Christians, and you rejoice in that, and it makes you full of joy and peace and a sense of security. But at the same time, there is a loved one about whom you have an unceasing anxiety. You can understand Paul's truthfulness if you're in this condition. Underlying all the joy and the peace is this constant nagging sorrow. And it's there and you can't help it being there and Paul is revealing it. Other people wouldn't have known about this secret burden unless he told them. But he said, you may not believe it, looking at me. You may not believe it the way I preach. But there's an anguish in my heart all the time. It's unceasing. I never get away from it. And it's the anguish of my fellow countrymen. One of the things that Christianity does to you is to make you a better patriot. There is something wrong if a person's converted here in England and says, I have a burning passion to save the African and I'm going to go out there and preach. If at the same time he shows no compassion whatsoever for his fellow Britishers, there's something wrong. Now, Paul had a passion to save the Gentiles, but along with it there went an intense Christian patriotism and a desire that his own nation should come to know the Lord. Now, that's what Christian faith does to you. And it's sheer hypocrisy to develop a passion for some other nation and overlook your own. The first compassion that is born in you when you are a real Christian is a passion to save those who are nearest to you, those who share your flesh and blood, those who share your nationality, those who share your own background. They're the first mission field that God has called you to. And Paul was no exception. He was called to be a missionary to the Gentiles, but he always had this anxiety about his own fellow countrymen. See how far this compassion and love went. He actually says this, having just said in the previous verse, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ, he now says, I wish I could be. Having said nothing can get me away from Christ, he now says, I could wish myself cut off from Christ. Now that's an extraordinary contrast. Straight after saying the one, he says the other. Now why does he say that? Nothing can separate me, but I wish I could be. He wishes he could be if that would save his fellow countrymen. Now it's not just being willing to die for them, it's going much further. He said, I would go to hell forever if I could get my nation to heaven. Now there are very few people rise to the heights of love like that. But I'll tell you this, it's those who have a love like that for their loved ones who stand most chance of reaching them for Christ. Who love their loved ones so much that they, they say to them, I would rather you get to heaven and I went to hell than the other way on. I would rather come under the curse of God if you could have the blessing to save you coming under the curse. What love. Moses had this compassion and he said, Lord, if you won't forgive this people Israel, blot me out of thy book, I pray. If that's the price, you can blot me out if you'll forgive them. Now such compassion has come up again and again in people's hearts. It came up in David Brainerd as he preached to the Red Indians of New Jersey. And he wept over them and he prayed just that prayer, Lord save them, damn me if that'll help, but save them. Henry Drummond in his work among the students of Edinburgh University prayed the same prayer. And he led more students to the Lord than anyone else in that university. Now, you see the compassion. It's the compassion of Christ. Only a man in whose heart Christ's compassion dwells could pray that prayer. Because Christ not only prayed it, he did it. Christ went to hell that we might go to heaven.
Christ was accursed of God, cut off from the love of God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, that we might come to know it? What a compassion to have. Now, may I just underline this? I'm spending a lot of time on this this morning, but I want you to remember this, even if you go away arguing about the rest. The right reaction to being chosen and called of God is not to look round at everyone else and say, blow you, Jack, I'm all right. To say, God has chosen me, you're going to hell. It's to say, I wish I could change places with you. I wish I could somehow get you to accept the call of God, even if it meant that I had to be out of it. You see the right reaction. Sometimes predestination, the calling and choice of God, has twisted Christians' mind so that their attitude to others has been one of conceit and pride. I've been called and you haven't. But the right reaction to predestination is to say, I just wish I could swap places with those who haven't accepted God's call. That's love and compassion. Of course, God could never let Paul do this any more than he could ever let Moses do it. There was only one person that God ever allowed to do this, and that was his own son. And it was because his own son was accursed of God that we can be blessed. Now, the agony of Paul's mind was not only his concern for Israel, it was the fact that they had had a better opportunity to be in God's blessing than any other nation. And he makes a list of the things that God had given to them that he gave to no one else. To, theirs, to them belongs the sonship. God meant them to be his sons. To them belongs the glory, the glory of God in the cloud came down on Israel and on no one else. To them belongs, belong the covenants God made, covenant after covenant, marriage after marriage, promise after promise. To them. To them belongs the law. Who got the Ten Commandments? Jews. To them belongs worship. God's worship was centered in the Old Testament days on one building, and it was in the middle of the Jewish land, the temple. To them belong all the promises, and there are thousands of them in this book, and they belong to the Jews. And to them belong the patriarchs. Do you realize that this morning we worship the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? The first hymn in the worship at 11 o'clock is a Jewish hymn which is, was written down in a Jewish synagogue in London and we're going to sing it to a Jewish tune. So we shall begin our worship this morning with a Jewish hymn and a Jewish tune praising a Jewish God because the patriarchs, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that's the God you know. And above all, to this little nation, in that little land at the center of the then known world, to that little nation, God gave the Christ. Jesus was a Jew. Every time you meet a Jew, you should remember that. You're meeting someone who belonged by flesh to Jesus Christ, and he belonged to them. Now, God didn't scatter these blessings among the nations. He didn't give the Americans the covenants, and the British the worship, and the Russian the promises. He didn't do it that way. He took all these together, and he gave them to one nation to give to others. And the tragedy is that every one of those things they took and they threw back in his face. When he sent his only son to them, they took him and they crucified him. That's the agony of it. And Paul, the missionary to the Gentiles, was taking the things that God had originally meant for the Jews and he was giving them to the Gentiles and they were taking it eagerly. Now, I wonder if I could use a very simple illustration. Here is a mother who plans a special treat for the children's dinner and she prepares it and cooks it lovingly and she brings it onto the table and they take one mouthful and they push it away and they say it's horrible, we don't like it one bit and we're not going to eat it. So finally she takes it and she gives it to the dog and that which she had spent so much time on and love on 
was turned down and she passed it to the dark. Now that's the same illustration that Jesus used to a woman who was a Gentile who asked for something that belonged to the Jews and Jesus said it is not right to take the food for the children and give it to the dogs. So I'm just using our Lord's illustration there. Now that's how Paul felt as he gave out the promises and the sonship and the glory and the Christ to Gentiles and they lapped it up and he knew all the time that this had been meant for the Jews and that they had turned it down. Can you imagine the sorrow and the anguish in his heart? And all he could do was bless God for ever giving the Jews such a chance. He said, God, you gave so many blessings to them. Blessed be God forever and ever. Amen. That you should give such opportunities to that nation. And yet they failed him. Now at this point, somebody might say that God's promises had failed. God's word had failed. But Paul has got to say, it was not God's word that failed with the Jews, it was God's people. It was the Jews that failed, not their scriptures. Their promises didn't fail. But people say they did. God promised to make the Jews this, that, and the other. And look what's happened. God's word has failed. His promises haven't been kept. Paul said that's utterly wrong. God's promises never fail. You are thinking wrongly when you say that because the Jews failed, God's word failed. And he now must give three answers to that objection. And the first answer is this. God never made promises to all the Jews, only to some of them. And one of the fundamental mistakes that the Jews have made, and it is a fatal one as well as a fundamental one, is the assumption that God's promises apply to all the Jews. They don't. They only apply to a handful of them. And God's promise to that handful has not failed. The others could have shared the promise, but they didn't. But the promise hasn't failed. And some have received it. Now, it's funny, but we still think like this. We think that because my parents were Christians and my grandparents were Christians that I'm all right. That I've been born in a Christian land and therefore I, I'm a Christian. The Jew thinks like that. And he thinks that because he was physically descended from Abraham, the promises belong to him. They don't. In fact, within the nation of Israel, it's only a small minority, a remnant as it's called, in the Bible, a remnant that in fact inherits God's promises. His promises were never to the whole nation. They were to a certain group or remnant within them. You see, the children of Abraham to whom the promises were given are not the physical children but the spiritual children. Not those who share his blood but those who share his faith. John the Baptist said this. John the Baptist said to the Jewish nation, don't call yourselves sons of Abraham because you're physically descended from him. You're not. If you repent, you'll become his sons. Jesus said the same. He said, you may be Abraham's seed, but you are not his children. You may be his descendants, but you are not his sons because you don't have his spiritual character. And only the Jews who share Abraham's spiritual character receive the promises. God's promises hold true. It's the people that failed. And that's the first answer he gives. He now illustrates this from the lives of Abraham and of his son Isaac. Take the family of Abraham. Wonder if you know how many sons Abraham had. It's quite a test of your knowledge of the Bible. Now you know that his first son was a boy called Ishmael. His second son was Isaac. And then he had five others by a woman called Keturah. So that he had seven children by three women. Firstly Hagar, who bore Ishmael. And then Sarah, who bore Isaac. Then Keturah, who bore five more. 
Now there were five children in Abraham's own family. How many of them inherited the promise from Abraham? Only one. Only one. And though there were seven who could call themselves his children, only one got the promise. Why? Because only that one had been born according to God's will. Only one. And here we have a picture. Only those who are in God's will inherit the promise. And most of the Jews got right out of God's will and therefore couldn't expect the promise to work. God's promises work when you're in his will. They don't work outside it. And so Isaac was the only one to inherit. Now at this point someone may say, well, fair enough, but Isaac was the only boy born within the marriage relationship. In a sense the other six were all born out of wedlock. Isaac was the only one born in wedlock and therefore it's understandable that he was the only one to inherit. All right, we go on to the next generation and what do we find now? We find Isaac and Rebekah and there are twins in Rebekah's womb and they are born of the same parents at the same time in the same circumstances. Now which of those two inherited did they both, even though they were both full-blood children of the same parents at the same time, born the same day? No, only one did. And Jacob and Esau were born. Now according to all human rules, Esau should have been the one to inherit the promise. He was slightly older by just 20 minutes or so. But no, he didn't. Jacob was the one who inherited because God had planned that. And God planned it before they were born, and God planned it before they'd done anything good or bad, so it had nothing to do with the sort of life they lived, nothing whatever. It was entirely God's choice. Therefore, Paul says, the only Jews to inherit God's promises are those whom God chose to inherit them. In Abraham's family, Isaac, in Isaac's family, Jacob, and down through the Jewish nation there runs this smaller group of God's choice who inherit the promises. Therefore God's word hasn't failed, it's been fulfilled. Never forget that some Jews have inherited the promise. Never forget that this Bible, but for one author, was written by Jews who believe. Never forget that Christ himself was a Jew, that every one of the twelve apostles was a Jew. This was God's remnant, and the promise did come true, not over the whole nation, but over God's chosen remnant. Now you can see we're right up to the eyebrows in the problem of predestination, aren't we? If God chose these people before they were born, before they did anything good or bad and quite unrelated to the sort of life they would live, is that fair? Is it not unjust of God to say, I will have Jacob and not Esau? Is it not unfair of God to say, I will have Isaac and not Ishmael? Is it not unfair of God to choose certain Jews and not the others to inherit his promise, since it's obviously a matter of his choice, and not of theirs. Well, many people have argued like this. And if you tell anybody that God chooses some and not others, they will immediately say it's unfair, it's unjust, and we've got to tackle this difficulty head on. Paul did. Well, now, how did he tackle it? A person who accuses God of being unjust doesn't know God. That's the first thing to say. God is a just God. God is a righteous God and he will never, never, never do anything unfair. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And whatever questions there may be in my mind about predestination, I've come to the point where I dare not think that God is unfair. That's the first thing to be said. God unjust? God unfair? Never.
Now the second thing that needs to be said is this. A person who says that it's unfair of God to choose some and not others has overlooked the fact that it is not fair for God to choose any. I mean by that that none of us deserve to be chosen. No one deserves it and therefore you cannot say it is unfair when he chooses some. Now let me take a story that Jesus told which illustrates how wrong our human thinking is. One day there were a group of unemployed men standing at the labor exchange and a farmer came along and he said to the first group of men who were standing there, would you like work today? Got a job up at the farm and they leapt at it, of course they would. Right, he said, I'll pay you a fair day's wage if you come and work for me. About halfway through that day, he went back to the labor exchange. There was another group of men standing there. They were out of work too. Their families were starving. They needed work. And so the farmer said, come and work in my farm. And they came. And an hour before knocking off time, the farmer passed the labor exchange again. And there were a group of men again. And they were needing work to feed their families. So he said, you go into my vineyard. Now when the end of the day came, the farmer knew that all those men needed a day's wage for their families. So he gave them all enough to feed their family. And the shop steward was after, them, after him immediately. And the shop steward said, wage differential. We've worked all day. They've only worked an hour. And you're giving them the same. And the farmer's reply was, are you going to be evil and niggardly because I am generous and good? You see, they had been thinking it's unfair. We deserve more than they did. The simple truth is that not one person in the world deserves to go to heaven. If any do, it's not injustice, it's mercy. If any of us ever gets there, it's of God's mercy and his mercy alone. To talk of justice and injustice when we all deserve to go to hell is quite beside the point. If God chooses one and only one to go to heaven, that's mercy. It's not injustice, because even that one didn't deserve it. And it is God's right to do what he wills with what he has. We have no right to tell him and say, we deserve more than they do. We'll not come to heaven at all if you don't bring us all. This kind of shop steward attitude to God is totally out of place. God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. In other words, Moses, you leave me to decide who I have mercy upon. It's not a question of justice or injustice. It is God's mercy that he chooses anyone. Furthermore, it is perfectly just if God chooses a person to demonstrate his wrath and his power to destroy. They deserve it. There is no injustice in that either. And the example here, if Moses is the example of God's mercy, chosen not because of man's will or man's exertion, but chosen because of God's will, then equally God demonstrated his justice in choosing Pharaoh to be an example for all time of his wrath and his power to destroy. Mind you, Pharaoh deserved it. It's patently obvious from the scripture that it was nothing less than justice. You remember that Pharaoh said to Moses, Who is Jehovah that I should obey him? I'm not paying any attention to God. And ten times God in his patience said to Pharaoh, Let my people go. And ten times Pharaoh said, No. And so God said, I choose you to demonstrate my power to the whole world. I'm choosing you as an example of my wrath. And he did. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart. There's nothing unjust about that. Only if you've got the kind of mentality that thinks that man has rights before God. All of us deserve to be treated as Pharaoh was. Is it unjust if God chooses Pharaoh that way? You notice that the key phrase is, I will. God has a perfect right 
to choose whom he will. None of us deserve anything. All of us deserve to be vessels of wrath. If God chooses some to be vessels of mercy, is that unfair? No, it's just sheer mercy and compassion. If he uses others as Pharaoh's vessels of wrath, who can accuse God of being unfair? If I could sum all this up in one sentence, I would say this. I stand here this morning as a believer in God's free will. I meet hundreds of people who want to believe in man's free will. I want to believe and preach God's free will. God is free. That's the Bible teaching. And the way some people talk about man's free will, they want a puppet up in heaven who'll just do what man tells. They have no conception of God's free will. God's free will means that he is absolutely free to choose anyone either for mercy or for power. He is free. Let God be free and every one of us be bound. But that's the right order. That's the right way around. God's free will. Christians who really know God know that God has free will. They are more content with that than with man's free will. But now at this point, someone else will object. And you know, it's amazing how Paul anticipates 20th century arguments. I've heard modern students bring up exactly the same points as are brought up here. The next thing is this, all right, if it's God's will, he can't blame me if I'm not one of his children. If God hasn't chosen me, well, who can resist his will? If he decides everything, then you can't blame me for not being a Christian. You can't blame me for being a wicked man. Now, isn't that interesting? This is just what people argue. If you tell them that God's free will chooses, they will say exactly that and try and excuse the responsibility for their sin. Now, let me make it quite clear. The Bible is absolutely positive on this point. You are responsible for your sin. God is not. His free will doesn't mean that you are not responsible. That's absolutely clear. Now, I don't understand that. I can't explain it, but I know it to be true. God has said equally plainly that he will account you responsible for your sin. And you know in your hearts that you are responsible. But that's not how Paul answers it here. If you are tempted to say, why should God blame me if it's all his will, if it's all his choice, the answer that Paul gives is this. Haven't you got things a little wrong in asking that kind of question? Have you any right to answer back to God? In other words, it's not just something wrong with the question. There's something wrong with the questioner who says that. He's in a wrong relationship to God. If you're properly related to God, you don't answer back. And he now uses a simple illustration. Have you ever watched a putter working with clay? And as the wheel spins round, those deft fingers and thumbs bring up sometimes a beautiful vessel, graceful for flowers, and sometimes he brings up an ugly vessel for cooking or for holding food. It's in the potter's hands. The clay can't suddenly shout out, Stop! You're making me the wrong shape. I didn't want to be that shape. It has no right to shout that out. The potter and the clay. The potter has complete control of and authority over the clay. The shape of that vessel will be the shape that his will intends, the shape that his mind intends. The relationship between creatures and the creator is clay to the potter. And anybody who answers back God and says, why should you blame me for my sin, it's all your fault, is a person who has not realized that God is God and man is man and that God is creator and man is creature and that God is everlasting spirit and that man is dust of the earth, clay. God has every right to make us whatever shape he wills. You don't answer back like that to God. Now you know to the unsaved person that's the finish. They say, oh well, very well, it looks as if it's heads, heads you win, tails, you lose, tails I lose, Lord. Can't get the better of you. <laughs> 
You just say whenever I have a real question, not going to answer it, you're the clay, I'm the potter. Well, fair enough, but that's, that simply reveals the need to get rightly related to God. Because when you're an unbeliever, you talk about God as if he was another man, as if he had no rights of his own. May I again stress, God has free will, and we have no right whatsoever to tell him what to do with us. He made us for his purposes. And if God wills to use one person to demonstrate his mercy and another to demonstrate his justice, who are we to answer back? Because, in fact, all of us deserve to be used to demonstrate his justice. Do you know, we're just like Simon Peter. The Lord Jesus came to Simon Peter and said, Simon, I want to wash your feet. And Peter said, you're not going to wash any of me. Simon, unless I wash you, you don't belong to me. All right then, Lord, wash the whole lot of me, head and hands, the lot. Do you notice how Peter wanted to stay boss? And in exactly the same way, we come up against God's predestination and call of those on whom he will have mercy, and we say, Lord, none of us are going to be saved unless you save all of us. We're not going to have this differentiation. We'll have the union after you, if you choose some and not others. And just like Peter, we want to tell God what to do. God knows what to do, and his purpose is to choose some and not others. But that's not an irrational or arbitrary or capricious choice. He's not just picking names out of a hat. He has a purpose in it. And we now go on to God's reason for doing this, Behind all that reason for choosing some Jews and not the others is the plan of using the Jews to give a double demonstration of his justice and his mercy to other people who didn't even belong to the Jewish race. When the Emperor Frederick V said to the philosopher Heidegger, Give me one proof of the existence of God, Heidegger replied, Your Majesty, the Jews. If you don't believe in the mercy of God, look at the Jews. And if you don't believe in the punishment of God, look at the Jews. And God demonstrated both through them in order that we Gentiles might come to share. That was the plan that we might have not only the blessing but the curse set before us in his people, that we might have both demonstrated to us. Mind you, God was wonderfully patient with the vessels fitted for wrath, wonderfully patient, over centuries, but he chose them for that. Now this is nothing new, Paul says, it's there in your Bible. Hosea said, not everybody outside Israel will be lost. In this very place where I have said to Gentiles, where you've said to Gentiles, you are not God's people, it will be said they are my people. You realize that most of us here this morning are Gentile by background and origin, and yet you are God's people. And Isaiah said not everybody inside Israel will be saved. Indeed, if God was simply just, there wouldn't be a Jew walking the earth today. If God had given them what they deserved, they would have vanished from history altogether. Do you know at the bottom end of the Dead Sea there is a flat area where a few stunted bushes grow and where the rest is just bare and dead and desolate. The only trace of human occupation you can find is the corner of a cemetery. And there is the site of two magnificent cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. And there's not a soul left from those two cities. And Isaiah said, if God treated the Jews as they really deserved, they would have fared like Sodom and Gomorrah, because the very sins and immoralities of Sodom and Gomorrah found their way into Jewish social life. And if God had treated them with only justice, there wouldn't be a Jew alive today. But he didn't out of his mercy. He kept some of them. He chose to keep a remnant. It was his right to choose them and his reason for doing so.
was to make them the nucleus of his people and to bring the Gentiles in with them. So that as Hosea had seen, Gentiles would become God's people, but God's people would still include some of the Jews, and together they would become the people of God. I must finish. May I finish by saying this? Why bother with all this this morning? It'll just raise many questions in your mind. Or you may say, well, what has this got to do with us? It's all about the Jews. Shall I tell you this? I believe that chapters 9 to 11 will give you a proper view of God. And balance the intimacy of chapter 8, whereby you cry, Abba, Father, with the reverence of chapter 9, whereby you say, God, you have a perfect right to do with me what you will. If you damn me, it would be justice. If you choose me, it's mercy. But I will never answer back. You are righteous. You are just. You are fair. And whatever you do is right. And I can just praise you that you chose some of those Jews to inherit the promise. And that you chose some Gentiles too, including me, to be part of the people of God. That's the right response. Not to answer back. Not to argue. Not to say God is unfair. Not to say God is to blame for my sin. He's nothing of the sort. But to say God is God. And I am man. God is creator and I'm a creature. God is the potter. And I am the clay, and he has a right to do with me whatever he wills, and to do with the Jew whatever he wills, to have mercy upon whom he will have mercy, and compassion upon whom he will have compassion. Let us go into the worship of God like that, and remember that we are the clay, worshipping the potter this morning. Amen.